flick of a switch, Bobby. We are back. Dying Scene Radio, welcome. How's it going, Bobby? Bob, it's been two weeks, man. Long overdue. Yep. I was moving, getting situated, so we had to take a week off. What did you do on our break? I crashed my computer, and I burned a church down. You burned a church down, Bob? We're not going to go there. Wait a second, I, Bob. Did you burn? I saw something on the Facebook about Pigpen getting kicked out of a show or canceling the show. What? Can you tell me what happened with that? Uh, I'll put it to you in a nutshell. We were paid not to play. The club owner got scared. They what? saw the first band. They said, this show is over. Uh, let's not get into that. Let's talk about the punk rock, Bobby. Bob, you know what's a great thing about this week? I got a chance to interview. I made up for the little break that we had, and I got to interview the legendary Godfathers of Oi, Cox Spara. Is that the it official was, way to was, say it, Spara? That's the, that's the official way to say it. And you know what? I really took one for the team on this one. Now, Bob, you've taken me to school on so many different things. And for me to go into the lion's den and talk to these guys with the amount of knowledge under my belt, I'm a dumb American. Half of our listeners are definitely dumb Americans. More than half, probably. And I didn't know how to pronounce their name properly. Well, now I know. And now everybody who listens to the interview should know. Because I got to go in there and definitely make an ass out of myself. You know, it's weird. They started off as Cock Sparrow, and it's a Cockney dialect phrase for... A person of familiarity, somebody who's your friend. Hey, yo, Cock Sparrow. I don't know what happened that they changed the spelling like that, but when they change the spelling, it gets very confusing because as an American, you pronounce it Cock Sparrow, like somebody who's sparring with you, you know? Yeah, I, like crossing swords. I got you. I know what you're saying, Bobby. That's why I had to ask. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, this week's sponsor is FatEnzo.com. Anybody out there in the scene, if you're in a band, you need some merch, Check out Fat Enzo T-shirts. Actually, it's Fat Enzo T-shits. They leave the R out. It's like a Boston pronunciation, and the logo is a dog shitting out a T-shirt. So check them out, fatenzo.com. Sounds like a uh, a perfect example of the fine work that they do over there in that sweatshop. That's hey, guess right. what's coming up this week, dude? Uh, record Store Day this weekend, this Saturday. You planning on picking up some wax? No, I was not, Bob. The truth is, no, I was not. Are you? There's three record stores in Tampa Bay here where I live at. I plan on visiting at least two of them. But if I can make it to a third one, why not? There's lots of cool stuff going on, man. And it's our Super Bowl, buddy. It's time to go out and pick up some vinyl. They got some brand new music. And you know what I got? It's almost pre-release, but it's not pre-release. Okay, so let me explain this. I got some stuff that Off is putting up on their Record Store Day 10-inch vinyl called Live from the BBC. Now, it's not brand new stuff because the track Meet Your God, which I'm getting ready to play here, it's already been out. Dude, you've got to go and check out the video for this. It's got Jack Black in it. Oh, it's fucking awesome. Need I say more? Go check it out. Now, this track right here, this is Off. Happy Record Store Day, everybody. Meet Your God, Dying Scene Radio. is Blag the Ripper representing the Dwarves and you're tuned to the sounds of Dying Scene Radio. Now 
There was some brand new stuff right there from Good Riddance. That brand new record comes out April 21st on Fat Records. I actually got my uh, copy just the other day, Bobby. I definitely dig it. And you can check it out streaming right here on DyingScene.com. Check it out on Pandora. If you're in Europe, visions.de. I don't know what the hell that is, Bobby, but that might be some kind of a music site over there in the uh, the UK. UK listeners, school me. Visions? Yes, visions.de. Bob, going back to record store day here, I was never really into vinyl like that. You are. Uh, evidently, you got a record player there. You buy the vinyl records and do that collecting. You know what? Uh, traditionally, not so much. You know, just as a fan and as I get older and more eclectic and set in my ways, I don't know, man. I need a hobby. So I've got a stack of records that I've accumulated over the years from going to shows, playing shows, doing a radio show, and I even have a turntable. But I don't really play it very often, but it's just something cool to have. And I like it. I like the idea of vinyl, man. I like it. I don't think the cassettes are a good idea. And the eight tracks, that's a waste of time. Yeah, I got some of my grandfather's old operas, man. Old school from the early 1900s. And um, I was thinking about getting a record player, man. They're not that expensive, man. I've got two of them. I got one I picked up at a yard sale for $10. And then I got another one that uh, is a USB gimmick. And it works perfectly, man. It goes through whatever gimmick you got. Boom. Let me give a little bit of news here, Bob. Make up for the two weeks. There were two deaths. Two prominent people in the punk scene passed away, unfortunately. Bassist Heiko Schrappel of the San Francisco Punk Act, One Man Army, passed away. Our thoughts are with his family and friends. One Man Army released their EP, She's an Alarm, on August 28th via Adeline Records. That's sad news. And also, Emilio Navarez, bassist of the Oakland Punk Act, The Lucky Egypt, was tragically killed while loading here at a show outside of the Golden Bull Bar around 1 a.m. It's a venue located near Oakland City Hall. So anyway, two deaths in the punk scene. Our condolences, of course, go out to the families, and I now begin taking bets for number three. Every time we report a death, you bet on that there's going to be three. Can you give me a third death? Who else died? Can we close this chapter uh, out? I don't know. The guys from Coxbar are, are pretty old. So you're going to go it's with okay. Coxbar. That's nice. Uh, okay, then I'll go with Pears. <laughs> you're going to go what? Pears? Yeah, with Pears. That's the band that you interviewed this week. Yeah, I got the opportunity to go and talk with the guys. The New Orleans-based band called Pears. Someone said they're the last great hope of punk rock. I doubt that seriously, but a very cool band nonetheless. We'll talk to those guys soon. In the meantime, it's being touted by DyingScene.com as a brand new track from the Queers. However, I I must uh, deflect and say it's not a brand new song. This Queers track right here, though, however, Uncouth, was written by my good friend Chris Barrows and done by the Queers. And it's on the new 7-inch that is being released with uh, the antagonizers ATL and the Queers. So the song is more of a re-release then it is a new song. But nonetheless, here's another uh, seven inches coming out this Saturday on Record Store Day. It's the Queers doing Uncouth on Dying Scene Radio.
I'm Sean, and this is our robot robot. Hello. Our band is named Harder Control, and you're listening to Dying Sing Radio. Y'all can suck it. It's a plague, it's a curse, it's a goddamn nightmare. It's all I think about, I don't know what to do. Could you help me, save me, snap me out of it? Could you teach me how to be like you? Lie awake at night and think about your future. Does it even really matter? Sitting here, it's Dying Scene Radio, and we're with Pears, who has the most awesome tour van I've ever seen in my entire life. Thank you. Craigslist acquisition is what it was? $4,000. You guys hold hands very cute like that. That's uh, You guys Thank share you. a common bond. You play in a band together. Yeah. You, you share this van together. Uh, how stinky are the farts we in the share, van? We share beds. Every time we get a hotel room, me and Brian share a bed. Uh, the farts aren't that stinky. It's just like, like our butts and stuff. Jet yeah. said it's pretty stinky. No, no, the feet get bad. That's really the worst thing. Oh, uh, man, yeah. you got to have a no feet, you know, rule like you got, you know, shoes. Everybody has the shoes on. Everybody yeah. no feet. <laughs> no feet. <laughs> no feet allowed. You got to keep them out of the window or take them off. So, what kind of mileage is this thing getting? This thing uh bad. But you know, the the price of gas is pretty cheap these days, so it makes it easier to uh, to hit the road. You guys are on the road with uh Teenage Bottle Rock. How many dates are you doing? 11 with yeah. them. This is uh this is night three here, uh, uh, at, I figured out day forty six in a row. Yeah, you guys. So you guys have been busy now. You guys have a record that's out that's brand new. Is it an EP? Is a full length? What do you got? It's a full length. Uh, it's not. It, 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 let's just keep calling it brand new. It's a brand new full length. <laughs> uh, brand new as of uh, September, I guess. It's still kind of new. Yeah, it's still kind of new. Uh, I've played the songs too many times, I have, but I played them enough. Jarrett's new. He hasn't played them enough. And uh, but you haven't heard them probably, so listen to them, please, 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 and come see us live. Thanks. I've definitely heard uh, a track or two that you guys have made available through the website dyingscene.com. Mm-hmm. So uh, tell us a little bit about the band. You guys are from New Orleans. You're on the road now, forty six days in a row. Is that what it is? Yeah, we just went to uh, we just did Europe with uh, Red City Radio, and that was awesome. And then uh, flew right back and did like uh, ten days with Off Their Heads. And uh, now we're doing this. Twelve days without their heads, and now we're doing this, and uh, getting ready to record another one. You guys owe part of your—I uh, don't want to say success because look at your van, but uh, part of your uh, part of the fruits of your labor are, are courtesy of some of the guys from—is off your off of your heads. They're the only reason that we <laughs> are doing anything. How, how did you? Uh, how did you make us. that hook up? Uh, we actually we played our first show ever with off of their heads on Mardi Gras Day last year uh, with off of their heads and uh, the Slow Death. And uh, we met Ryan that day, and he just dug what we were doing. And uh, when we we put the record out ourselves digitally, 
and on CD or whatever. And then he's like, well, so what are you going to do about a vinyl? We're like, we don't have any money. So then he offered to do it for us, and that dude's a savior. So I'm going to be in New Orleans in about a month. What's the punk scene like in New Orleans? <laughs> it smells bad. It's fun, man. Uh, there's, there's, there's good bands, and they're really great people. I mean, the bands are all right, but the people are fantastic. With as much uh, shows as you guys are doing outside of your hometown, what are your hometown shows like these days? We've only played like five or six. Uh, <laughs> we, we, good. we don't spend much time there. Uh, I think we've played Omaha more than we've played uh, New Orleans. Yeah, Omaha more than New Orleans. Omaha, Nebraska. How many times have you played Omaha? Uh, three or four. Yeah, realistically, it's three or four. Not quite as many as New Orleans. Sure, but still. Uh, close. Yeah, still. May as well be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Alex is here now. Oh, hey, Alex. Come on over here, Alex. Everybody, welcome the one, the only, Alex Talbot! <laughs> <laughs> Nobody clap. It's very anticlimactic. That guy is yeah. motherfucking smooth. <laughs> After this tour with Bottle Rocket, what do you guys got going on? Back home? You got something else you're jumping on? Um, we're going back home, and we're going to rest for a minute because we're tired and sick. About a month. We're not going to we're gonna not going to wake up for a month. And then we're going to go do punk rock bowling and some shows at Strung Out and uh, Red City Radio and La Armada. And I think Master Shooter just got added to some of them. That's rad. And then uh, go home and record another record. Then tour forever again. When you guys go to Europe, what do you do with the van? Uh, well, we left it at Brian's girlfriend's, or Brian's house. Yeah, I forgot y'all live together now. Yeah, I just don't pay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's convenient. Uh, we left it at Brian's house, and, uh, it just gathers dust, I guess. It's kind of sad. America, America doesn't do what it does when we're not in it. Do you guys get a lot of comments when you're, uh, you know, driving down the road and this thing? Probably yes. more so than about There's anything. Offers. And we forget, you know? I mean, we've ridden around in it so much, we spend more time inside of it than we do out. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so you forget that it's on there and people are like, woohoo, yeah! And you're yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, what, Paris, what did we do? Uh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's, uh, you know the joke works when it's still funny a year later. $4,000 joke. Yeah, how many miles you put on it? Uh, you, you've been to Omaha four or five times. Uh, yeah, we put, we, I know we put uh, 35, no, no, no. Oh, we put 35000 on it between August and December last year, I believe. Wow. Holy uh, shit. Yeah, You're and driving I mean, it across the, the the ocean to uh, to the UK. That that is what we did. We there's there's a tunnel that nobody knows about except it's a us. Tunnel. That's, yeah. yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh -huh. What's what's the time on that? You know, is it any quicker than you know? Time stands air? still when you're underneath the water. Three hours. Three hours. That's good. That's good. Yeah, it. it I mean, the the tunnel through the water. There's also a wormhole. That that really takes care of a lot. It's a space time continuum then. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And they serve peanuts just like on the on the flights. Worm peanuts. Worm Except peanuts. Except the thing with these peanuts is people don't have allergies to them, and you don't have to worry about that bullshit. The thing is, is people who are allergic to peanuts eat the peanuts, and then by the time they get to the UK, there's, they went through a hole in time and space. They didn't eat the peanuts. They, it never happened. This is some fantastic talk with pears, man. Guys, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, no how do we find you guys on the web? You got a website? Uh, you can find us on Facebook at pears-theband or... Pearsband.bandcamp.com. You can download our record or on iTunes and Spotify and shit. And uh, Pearsband.com is our website. We don't update ever because I hate the internet. It gets too busy. You don't have internet in this thing, do you? No. Oh, it sucks. And uh, but yeah, anywhere on the internet, we're on we're on AskJeeves.com too. Ask Jeeves, huh? <laughs> yeah, we're really? the only thing that's left on that search engine. So isn't that kind of like one of the AOL properties, one of those dormant things? Yeah, you know? I think so. So you should have a GeoCities website then. Yeah, we have an Angel Fire site. Angel Fire, <laughs> perfect. Sunset Strip. <laughs> Stage. 
I'm Patrick. And I'm Brian. And, and we're, we're Entropy. Entropy. <laughs> You're listening to Dying Scene Radio. Right there was a brand new track from Entropy. Bobby, you talked to those guys a few weeks ago. I'm pretty actually amazed at uh, what they did. They went into the studio. They were bound and determined to spend a weekend in the studio recording and uh, releasing it shortly thereafter. Well, they succeeded. And uh, you can check out their new EP, So It Goes, with a free Name Your Price download on their Bandcamp site. Or you can check it right out here on DyingScene.com. Shark Sandwich, man. I dig that song. I like the real fast stuff that's in, out, over, done. Bobby? Yeah, Entropy. I think they said they were going to go in um, on Saturday and Sunday or something like that, and then they had it mixed by Tuesday. Something like that. They just wanted to test themselves because punk rock is not supposed to be absolutely perfect. It has to have a little bit of intricacies and things that are you know not so polished and i guess that was the goal just to get in there and record something and, and get it out there punk rock's an in and out thing anyway you know you, you they're quick songs you know it's verse chorus verse chorus maybe verse chorus chorus bridge chorus chorus verse chorus bridge out whatever you know it's it can be very formulaic but if you know what you're doing you get in there you get it done you get out and that's the way that it is and that's the way it's supposed to be good stuff there entropy New York Entropy, right? That's right. Entropy NY. Hey, Bob, have you ever heard of the band um, Dark Buster? Dark Buster? Boston-based band? Of course I have. Been playing those yeah, guys for Boston years. Band. They split up several years ago, so they've been dormant and uh, talking about doing some reunion shows. Are So it is rumored. What's the story, buddy? Well, Dark Buster's basically announced the first show since 2009, and the show takes place at the Sinclair in Cambridge, Massachusetts on August 3rd. So we'll bring you more information about that, but uh, you know, if you guys are interested in seeing Dark Buster, maybe making a trip or something, perhaps you should. Some supporting acts have been announced for that Dark Buster Boston comeback show as well. Slapshot, The Scandals, Have Nots, and more. So All Boston bands. Boston, loud and proud. So yeah, this week was the second anniversary of the Boston bombing. So Boston in the spotlight. Actually, my uh, good buddy who lives up in Boston, his brother is on the jury for that trial. Wow. We don't need to go there. Before we go and hear the Cox Bar interview that you did, Bobby, let's play this track right here from a UK-based ska punk band called Spanner. Now, these guys have announced a plan to release a new album called The Mivart Sections through Rebel Time Records and Riot Ska Records and Pumpkin Records. That's a lot of record labels all at one shot. You know that, Bobby? Anyway, give the track a listen right here, and uh, if you like it, go check it out on DyingScene.com and follow the links and uh, get yourself a copy. The 12-song record is going to serve as the follow-up to Spanner's 2014 split with the Montreal punk band called Action Sedition. Here it is right here. It's Spanner doing Banner Regime on Dying Scene Radio. Bye. 
Listening to Dying Scene Radio, this is Paris. Rock on. Fucking texting while he's talking to us. Hey, listen, I know I, I'm gonna have to resort to my notes here, okay? I, I apologize. You know, it's it's DIY stuff, man. This is punk rock, right? Yeah, it's punk rock. So it it's means, suitable, right? Means you can do no uh, research beforehand. <laughs> I fine. did do research. Google us, Google us. I was go- you know what? I was thinking actually about doing no research. Yeah. I was well, in the name of punk rock. Well, do we, no research. We know fuck all about ourselves anyway, so <laughs> this is Bobby Pickles with DyingScene.com and Dying Scene Radio, respectively. I'm in Greenpoint, Brooklyn today, in the Polish section. Of uh, the neighborhood, and I'm interviewing Colin McFowl. McFowl, <laughs> McFowl. Sorry, I... <laughs> fool. As an idiot, it's quite it's, it's easy to. <laughs> and Daryl uh... Smith. Yeah. Of the uh, that's easy to remember that one, isn't it? <laughs> of, yes, it and is. And is, is uh, Pickles your real name? Piccarillo. Piccarillo. Oh, I see what yeah. they did there. Robert Piccarillo. Yeah, I see what they did there. Your guys <laughs> at school, crazy. <laughs> of the iconic English punk band Coxbara. Spara. Uh, how is it pronounced? Well, here's the thing. A lot of Americans think it's cock sparer, as in sparring. Yes, I, that's how I think. I, but no, nothing to do with that. It's uh, cock sparer, and it's an old uh, East London term of endearment, meaning friend or mate. Hello, me old cock sparer. Hello, right. my, my old friend. Something like that. So it's something that has not translated well anywhere, not even in the rest of England. Is there any way to translate it at all to American from the Queen's uh, yeah, friend, Queen's English? Mate. Just mate? That's yeah. a fate. Hello, me old mate. Hello, my old friend. Hello, me old cock sparer. <laughs> Sparrows is, is is the way that these London people say sparrow, right? Which is what the small small bird. Right, small, that was the yeah. original name of the band. Correct, absolutely. How long was that the name of the band um, before it was changed? For about five years. Five years. For about five years. The band was formed in seventy two, yep. and we changed it in about seventy seven. And that's from Cockney, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah Can yeah. you help us out? You know, for all the us dumb Americans who don't know exactly what Cockney is, and so that's like a dialect of of English, right? Yeah. Just like a kind of uh, what. 
Um, it's for common people that haven't been brought up very commoners. well, and they, they they don't speak well. I'll have to refer you to uh, the, the genuine East Ender. It's a di- it's a dialect thing, as you say. It's like every every city has a has its own slang, has its own words for different things, and that's the one for East London, pretty much. I was going to ask you if you could maybe help me out, uh, you know, help me come out with like a term of endearment. I know this guy. This guy's pretty familiar with me. You know, uh, our production assistant there, Tony, and um, you know, maybe maybe you could help me out and figure out something that I could uh, that I could use with him, some kind of maybe saying or something like that, or word in Cockney. Uh, something though that I, you know. Insulting. That, that's what. That's really what I. <laughs> it doesn't have to be friend or mate or something. Something insulting. That I wouldn't I can, insult him. Just come on, no, no, please, no, please. He's a, he's a very hey, nice boy. Listen for the for the good of, no. of media. He's a diamond geezer, right? He's a, a di- he's a proper geezer, he's a proper yeah. diamond geezer. He's he proper diamond geezer. You guys say with proper accent. <laughs> <laughs> We're here after your uh, sound check at the second show of your two yep. show concert series in yep. New York City and uh, it's been 15 years since you played in New York City now evidently Wikipedia is incorrect when they state that in 2012 Cox Bar how do Cox Sparrow is it still pronounced no, Cox no, Sparrow no, Sparrow Spara. Sparrow 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 that's it yeah that's all <laughs> I tried to do we'll, the we'll make time. a Cockney hooligan out of you yet it's a fucking 30 minute interview with 25 minutes talking about how to pronounce the name of the band. You know? <laughs> I apologize. Uh, but in, anyway, Wikipedia says in 2012, Cox Sparrow. Uh, Good boy. Not bad. Not their 40th anniversary along with Rancid who celebrated their 20th and they played two sold out concerts in New York. No, so wrong. No. obviously that's wrong. Yeah. God, that was, Wikipedia that, that was in San sucks. Francisco. Right, okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. We can change that. How was last night's show? Was it a success? Yeah. It was brilliant. It was fantastic. Great crowd. Really up for it right from the start. I mean, this place is just such a good venue. Good crew, really friendly people. Couldn't do enough to help us. Mm-hmm. Uh, the atmosphere and the vibe in the whole place last night was fantastic. And everybody wanted a party right from the start. The two bands that made up the bill with us were also great. You know, fantastic. Got the crowd going. Really nice guys as well. Just perfect. Couldn't couldn't afford it at all. And they were loud. And that really sometimes you can be going down well, and you and but there's silence because of the acoustics of the place or whatever. But I think this was a perfect storm. They were really up for it. They were really loud, and the hall made it sound great. And it's it, it's still no matter how long we do it, it, you still get moments where the hairs on the back of your neck stand up when you have people singing everything back word for word. You know, and they were they were a great crowd last night. Absolutely. And the venue that we're talking about is called the Warsaw, and this is a this is a pretty big venue here in uh in brooklyn in new york city i've been here before i saw social distortion i was telling uh colin that uh, the acoustics weren't that great though last time when i saw social d and i couldn't really make out the words at all so but it was good it was a lot better i, I was listening to you guys at sound check and everything is great let us um, know tonight once you've seen the show I will. what it's like and then you said you, you played with murphy's law was it the first time that you've played with murphy's law yeah it is yeah and uh yeah. how did you like that yeah they're, they're great band. They're crazy right yeah great band great, awesome. people, yeah. great sense of humor good people yeah and that's what we're all, all about you know it's, it's about surrounding ourselves with we're not doing this because we have to do it we do it because we want to do it and we still enjoy it doing it we're not signed to a label or an agent or a management that makes things do uh do it on their terms we can do it on our terms which means we can choose the bands we want to play with and where we can we try to handpick the bill and, and play with the people that are the, you know absolutely we, have a, we can have a good time with and they were both two two great bands last so night. you guys don't really go on tour anymore this is a tour for us two dates that's two a, dates that's, yeah yeah that's... it's these sold out shows <laughs> these random sold out shows throughout the year right yeah. here and there hit and miss here's, right? a, here's the thing it? yes if um if we went on a seven date tour in all honesty come day seven the show wouldn't be as good as day one. And those people that have bought the tickets for that night deserve the same show. Well, of course, you can cash in and keep touring and taking the money, but don't cheat the people out of that. Our voices it's called phoning it in. Yeah, our voices, my voice would be fucked after three shows. You know what I mean? So you're, you're not putting on 100% come that time. We'd much rather come in, give it our best, and then go out and come back again. And we've also said that you know we will continue to do this for as long as people want to come and see us. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a real danger that you can become too over familiar by playing you know too often in the same places. If if your only incentive is you know the paycheck at the end of the day, and that's not what we want to do. We want to try and make it a special event. We want to try and make it a party every time so that people can just come down, have a good time, have something to look forward to, and then talk about it afterwards. 
It's a super special event. Another punk band out of order, out of Montreal. They're coming down here. I'm meeting up with them. Sweet. interviewed them before. Uh-huh. So many people are converging upon Brooklyn to check this out. Yeah, if, if you watered it down and you're torn all over the place yeah. all the time, yeah. it wouldn't be that same kind of thing. Even though you guys are so legendary and have influenced many, there's still newbies out there. The young generation of punk rockers who may be just learning about Cox Spara and your roles in the creation of the punk rock genre. So some of my questions, as you've noticed, do reflect some of that. And they're meant to introduce you guys and to inform them. So that's just an exclaimer. I should have actually said that before we talked about the, <laughs> the band name and everything. Yeah, most of our readers are Too dumb late. Americans, yeah. just like myself. But just to bring us dumb Americans up to speed, the band was formed in 1972 in East London, like you guys are talking about, yep. at a time when there was really no punk. And your biggest influences were bands like The Who, for Christ's sakes. Well, yeah, I mean... Well, when, according to Wikipedia, of course, which is <laughs> wrong, which we just fun, talked the about. The fun of all knowledge, of course, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it was? I think the thing is, I think you, you, you're influenced by what's around at the time. You know, and we were, I was 16 in 1972. So you listen to what songs you hear in the, in the charts and what, you know, what records you can buy or see on chart shows on the TV and things like that. And a lot of that influence of all those bands rub off on you a little bit. I mean, were the human influence? I'd say probably not, to be honest. But I mean, bands like Slade certainly were. Small Faces certainly were. You know, that's, that's where our influences came from. But individually, you know, we had older brothers and sisters who came home with Tamla and Stax records and things like that and played those till they wore out. And you couldn't help but be influenced by listening to Aretha Franklin and people like that. How know? many so, brothers and sisters do you have? It was National Sibling Day I uh, two, yesterday. I've got two older brothers and older sister. So they, they would buy records when they were released. They'd come home. They'd leave the arm off the, off the record player. So they'd just play over and over on repeat. And, you know, by the end of the night, you'd know all the words. Mm-hmm. So they were your influences. You know, they, they, they were the people that impacted upon what you liked and what you listened to. And at some stage, that shapes the type of music that you end up playing. You can't help that. Yeah, a lot of people would argue that you guys are the uh, godfathers of oi. It's been said. Which is a you know, crazy subgenre of punk rock. First of all, uh, well, what was the scene like back in 1972 or the lack thereof? There was like none, right? I mean, just like you were talking about There nothing, wasn't a scene. Right? And there wasn't a scene at all. Did you guys ever play with the Sex Pistols or the Clash or anything like that, being from no, East never London? No, never played in the same bill as those. I guess the, the, the nearest we came to playing with punk hierarchy was probably with a jam. Um, but again, it was a, a one-off situation. Um, we never really mixed in those sort of circles, to be honest, back in those days. Um, most of those guys came from outside of London or from the other side of London, um, and we never really mixed. See, the thing is, when the punk thing started, it came from the west end of London. and as, uh, Did it? Yeah, and it was very much an art school thing, you know? It was uh, a, bit like, a little bit like in New, New York, you know? It's, it, and these guys came from the wrong side of London, the, the east end, and it was, um, it was a little bit more street-based, you know? And... Probably the other punks would look down on the sort of stuff we were doing. It's a bit too, bit too real, you know, too and raw. a bit too raw. Well, that's what Oi is. Yeah. Well, I mean, but Oi hadn't, it, Oi is, Oi hadn't Oi started. Punk rock, but it stripped down to Oi, its Oi, bare. Oi came out of that. Oi, Oi, right. Oi was a, a, a direct um, reflection on, on the fact that we didn't fit in with their scene. You know, we refused to wear their bondage trousers. We wouldn't, we wouldn't buy t-shirts from you know a particular shop or wear a particular thing or do our hair in a particular style because that's what you need to be to be a punk you know bollocks we like the thinking behind it and we like the ethos behind it anybody can get up and do anything at any time and no one can tell you that you're shit yeah i like that but just whatever you know i wear whatever clothes i want to wear <laughs> You're always right. You see. 
Bobby, sounds good, man. This guy's at Cox Bar. Fucking, I'm envious, man. Anytime you get to go and hang out with uh, punk rock royalty, kudos to you, bro. Because You're Young was the track that we played right there. We'll have part two of that interview coming up a little bit later in this episode, so make sure that you stick around. And while you're over there talking about it, why don't you go ahead and share this episode with your friends and give us a like on Facebook. If you want, follow me on Twitter, at Bob Noxious. I know Bobby Pickles has one over there. What's yours over there? The Bobby Pickles, right, dude? I don't know, man. They can follow me or not. I don't I don't really give a fuck, actually. Because <laughs> that's punk rock, right? That's the real thing. The real thing is who gives a fuck. You know, do whatever you want. But yeah, Cox Bar, Because You're Young. I love that song, man. You know, I sing it to the bum, and I change the words, Because You're Dumb. It's a great song, man. I love, like, every Cox Spara song now, man. I became, like, a super fan. After meeting them and seeing that fantastic concert at the Warsaw in Brooklyn, and hearing all their classics, being in the pit, drinking beers with those guys. It was great, man. It was fucking great. I loved it. Let me ask you a question. Uh, didn't you run into our boys down there from Out of Order over at that show as well? That's right, man. Um, Scott came down from Out of Order from Montreal. and uh, Did he have to sneak in through Detroit? Bro, listen, Scott actually went completely MIA. We were supposed to meet up after the interview with Cox Spara. We were going to go get some barbecue before the show started. And he never showed up. Apparently, he had got drunk the night before. He had a <laughs> severe hangover. Then he was out doing tourist stuff or something like that. That led to more drinking. And he didn't stumble into the venue until Cox Spara was actually on. We made eye connection right in the hallway. And we said, what's up? He was going to the bar. I was going in to see the band. The security guards would not let us stop. We had to keep it moving, Bob. So... He came all the way down here. Our, our goal was to uh, meet up, at least have a beer together. We got as far as being in the room together for two seconds, <laughs> looking at each other in the eye, and well, that's uh, cool. walking our separate ways. Anyway. Well, at least he had this opportunity to pass you a copy of uh, the new CD that Out of Order's got, uh, Stuck in the Mud. What do you think, man? Should we? Uh, did he say we could play it, or should we ask him? Uh, it's sh- not a new... Should we just fucking play it, dude? Yeah, it's not... A- Let's just play it, Bobby. It's not a new CD. It's just they're still working on new stuff. Oh. And uh, he sent me some of their stuff because, you know, he's cool, man. I don't know. Uh, we become like homies. So anyway, he sent me some of his stuff, and I think it's some of the best stuff I've heard from Out of Order. I mean that. I really do. It's, well, I dig uh, this track right great. here. You know, Out of Order, it's that same kind of oi stuff. Just like Cox Spara, you know, that stripped down punk rock. Well, and, well, um, this is really good stuff, man. I don't know. What, what did you think about it? I like it, and you know what? Let's give it a minute to simmer on it. Why don't you tell us some punk rock news, and then we'll play that track. You got anything else going on? What's hot right. and juicy this week? Uh, do you know of a band called Emir? Emir? Metalcore Act? <laughs> yeah, uh, Emir. What, what, what's way, up with that? Way to go, Bobby. Report the news. You got to be able to pronounce their name. Come on, Emir. Yeah, well, that's yeah. a common theme within this podcast. I couldn't even pronounce the band's name, and I went to go interview them, dude. And Cox Spara. Dude, I mispronounced Colin's last name. The lead singer... Now, can you look up his last name? And I want you to pronounce it for me right now. Tell me how far off base I am. Uh, uh, Colin McFall? Uh, that's not it, really. It's like foul, almost. Foul? Okay. I got, Co- I got, basically, you get schooled as a dumb American from the English. Yeah. They know how to speak the Queen's English. And it's us, the Queen's uh, English. You know, it's Colin McFowl. Yeah. All right. Anyway, getting back to it. Emir. The Emir. They've it's, canceled it's, all. What? It's a Emir. They've Emir. canceled? They've canceled all their upcoming tour dates, Bob, including appearances at Grozneck and Slam Dunk Festival in May. Oh, Due to lead bummer. singer Frankie Palmieri's paralyzed vocal cord. That's pretty crazy, huh? Uh, someone's been tickling his tonsils a little bit too much. That's too bad. <laughs> it is. But in totally antithesis of that, Rise Against has announced a North American tour with Kill Switch Engage and let live so that's pretty cool and it's going to be all throughout july and august and they'll be coming up this way they'll be playing asbury park new jersey new york new york central park summer stage that's badass man rise against those are the free concerts well let me know how that one is i'm looking at the list doesn't look like they're going anywhere else other than the uh, the northeast and canada and they're heading west after that in august check your concert calendars or right here at dyingscene.com and get the official dates Bobby, you know what we got? We got some more time to kill before we get the rest of this Cox Spara interview going on. So, I don't know what, if Scotty approves. You didn't really have that opportunity to talk to him, but he gave it to you anyway, and I'm going to go ahead and make the executive call here, man. We're going to play it. You put it in my Dropbox. Here it is. It's stuck in the mud. 
by Out of Order on Dying Scene Radio.
That right there is the Colombian melodic skate punk hardcore band called 69 Infermos. Bobby and I, we exchanged a couple emails with uh, one of the cats in that band over the week, and uh, he turned us on to it. We said, hey, man, send it on in to Dying Scene, man. Just There's a little box that says Submit News. He did it, it got posted, and there you go. Well, they may be new to you guys. They've actually been around for 20 years. And uh, they've basically sung their songs in Spanish for the, the duration of their career, and it is their native tongue. But they're branching out. They're doing something different. They wrote at least this song in English. I believe they're trying to put the whole album in English. So we'll keep you posted, and let us know what you think, man. You got something to say? Why don't you go ahead and get in touch with us, man? The number to dial, 347-754-PUNK. That's 7865 for all you people who don't have uh, letters on your phones like in the old days. So what are you, what are you saying, out. Bob? If you're a band and you want to get played on the radio, Dying Scene Radio, you should get in touch with us. Is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> That's not what I said. Oh. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what I was saying. I was just, yeah, sure. Go ahead and send it to us. Oh, uh, I mean, you were talking about 69 uh, and Fairmos, and that's what they did. They're being played on the show there, and then you gave our number right afterwards. I was thinking that that's what you're inferring. What do you want to so, get? You want to oh, get me on a technicality? I, I, send us your hate mail, yeah, your I death apologize. threats, send panties, well concealed money, and any other pictures of your mother, your aunt, or your grandmother that you don't want to see, but we feel the rest of the world needs to see. Dying Scene Radio at gmail.com. You want to send me some personal hate nice. mail? It's uh, Bob Noxious at Dying Scene.com. And uh, Bobby Pickles over there has his own email address too. He likes hate mail. Send him your hate. He wants your hate. Dude, uh, there's a couple new videos released um, in the last uh, week and a half, two weeks, whatever. Pretty interesting. They're both from that new Rancid cover album, Hooligans United. Did you see any of these, Bob? Um, no. I saw that uh, there was some news about it. I didn't open it up. Oh, well, they posted two uh, new videos this week. One for Death by Stereo. They released a music video for their cover of Rancid's Rejected. re e e e e ejected Remember that one? It's fucking great, bro. With the bass line and song features Transplant's Skinhead Rob on vocals. So uh, you can check that video out on DyingScene.com. And then, um, like I said, another music video by Arizona hardcore punk band Bricktop has been released of their cover of Dead Bodies by Rancid for the Hooligans United tribute album. So that one you can check out on DyingScene.com as well. That's a really interesting one. Hooligans United has been released this week, and uh, you can get your copy and check that out. It's awesome. 50-plus tracks of uh, bands doing Rancid tributes, uh, Hooligans United. Looking at a lot of cool bands that are on there, man. Anna Flag, Authority Zero. I've seen a couple of names on here. Death by Stereo, as you just mentioned. So uh, I'll be excited to see this uh, record, I guess. I am a Rancid fan. You mentioned uh, the bass playing, and Matt Freeman is the, the fucking man, dude. He's uh, He's the guy who uh, all bass players want to be and want to be like, and he's with all their girlfriends. So there you go. Matt Freeman, That's granted. Right. That's right. Bob, before we come to a close on this uh, week's episode and uh, we finish up with this second Cox Sparrow interview, part two to the interview, I did want to get the word out that Gash, the band Gash out of Philly, I think you know those guys, right, Bob? You played uh, with them a couple times or what? Yeah, um, I've spoken with them before. Well, I've been talking with some of their representation, and they wanted me to get the word out that they have fired their current drummer, and so they're currently looking for a replacement. So if you reside in the Philly area, please reach out via gashofficial.com. All right? Just wanted to let everybody know about that. So there's a job out there. If you're a drummer in the Philly area and you want to play uh, with some crazy uh, S&M chicks in a punk band or whatever, hey. I'll tell you what, man. Uh, Bobby, for, for, the drummer, for the drummer, the view isn't bad. Uh, the ladies are nice to look at and uh, they are wearing leather, so get you some. Gash. Uh, I'm going to go take some drum lessons. They'll fill that gap soon, Bobby. Don't worry about it. I'm sure they will. So let's close the show out, man. I got a brand new track right here from a band called Anchor, who has just last week released their latest release, Distance and Devotion. The album is the follow-up to their 2011 called Recovery. This track's called Losing Faith, and we'll follow it up with uh, part two of that Coxpera episode. Bobby? Yeah, Coxpera, you fucking cunt.
Colin from Cox Barra. I'm with Daryl. Oi, oi, this is Cox Barra. Listen to Dying Scene, you cunts. Well, behave yourselves. Have fun. Cheers now. Dying Scene Radio. Which brings us to that story. Was it McLaren or whatever? Yeah. It's the guy, the producer. The story is he was coming out to see you guys. There's a couple things on the internet. Something about yeah. him not wanting to yeah. buy you guys a round of beers or something. Yeah. And then yeah. another one was about cutting your hair, yeah. right? I mean, McLaren at the, at the time, it's a perfectly true story. He was putting the pistols together. He was looking at what other bands he could, I guess, form. And it, it was like a... It's like a boy band situation, you know, he'd, he'd pluck people out that he thought would make a good band, you know, which is what, to be fair, the Sex Pistols and the Clash were. They were formed not because they were bunches of mates, they were put together for a specific reason, and that was for Malcolm McLaren and Bernie Rhodes to further their own careers almost, you know. It's true. I, I love the Clash. The Clash, my fa- the, the Clash is my favorite band of all time. Right. It's his deal. Yeah, but you know, if if you if you read the biogs, and you know, they spent a long time looking around at who they could recruit, you know, before they came up with the final lineup. Yeah, them. it wasn't an organic thing. I mean, the the, the difference with Cox Barra, apart from myself being the new boy, you pronounce it properly. Uh, yeah, I can say it. <laughs> these guys went to school with each other. It's a friendship, and out of friendship, when you're hanging out with these people, you're it, it, yeah. There's a natural chemistry. It's very organic. You're getting together. You're playing after school. You're jamming. You're learning things. It's very different from having a manager that's saying. I mean, and right the way through the Clash's career, right up to the point where they fell apart. Their manager, Bernie Rhodes, was dictating and was in Joe's ear and saying, you've got to get rid of um, uh, Mick. Mick Jones, yeah. and, that's, and to his dying day, that was uh, Joe's biggest regret, was that um, he, you know, they fired Mick Jones. Because after that, that last album, um, Cut the, yeah. the Crap, is no Clash album, it's you know? And no. God, you should have a fucking... Next time, you're getting a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're having a clash loving over here so, yeah. so, so when McLaren came down he said you know you'd have to do this you'd have to do that and we said well that's never going to work that's never going to work you know there's the door who said that it, we, we all did we just looked at him and said well, it's not going to happen you know forget it you know and, and what he, what he do might do you ever regret it never what he might have been looking at doing was perhaps you know plucking a couple of people from our band to fit in with another band or something perhaps that was his ulterior motive we don't know he never got that far to his credit, you know, he came from the west side of London over to a small crappy pub in East London. We were rehearsing upstairs and he came in in his fucking bondage trousers and his 600 pound leather jacket and sat down and listened to us go through a few of our very bad songs at the time. Saw something in it, I guess, but it just wasn't going to go any further. And we don't regret it at all. You know, having seen what happened to the Pistols and members of, and you know, we're happy with what we've got. I mean, the, the, what we have to say is where we are now, you know, we're perfectly perfectly grateful for the you know the decisions we've made along the way because we wouldn't be here now having this conversation had we made some of those other choices earlier on in our lives really. yeah because we do things on our terms and that you can't get much more diy than that whereas a lot of those other punk bands they were signed to majors you know they had other people pulling their strings um cox Barrow always came at the wrong time so in the whole 77 punk thing you could be any punk band in the UK and you were having independent chart hits, you know. Uh, they, they were on the, the, the chart shows selling 100,000 records. Cox Barra never quite hit the right time. And then it was too early for Oi because it was more real, but the Oi thing hadn't started. So that's why a lot of people refer to it as, you know, the founders of Oi. But we, we weren't there at the Oi scene. The Oi scene then came after the band had stopped again. So it was almost like we've always missed those places where you can pigeonhole us which has been great because then the years that we weren't playing this sort of cult status had had built up and people almost felt that they discovered their own it was their own dirty little secret you know i mean everyone likes the class and the pistols and the you know even other boy bands like you know the cockney rejects they sold thousands of records but cox barrow was this sort of almost mythical status it was no one had ever saw them in the early days because the gigs weren't big enough i was a fan of the band before i was in the band but there were never any pictures. I never met anyone that had been to a Cox Sparrow show. You know, so whilst we weren't playing, that's when the sort of mythical legendary status built up because it hadn't been overexposed. And that wasn't manufactured. That, that was just us doing things on our terms. That was, that was just us doing it when we could be asked, you know, when we'd be bothered to do it. Now, and, you guys will never play Shea Stadium. Yeah, and, and who cares? You know? <laughs> exactly. There you go. You know, uh, that's what music is about. I love the that's attitude. Music for music. Yeah. 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 Daryl, you were just talking about uh, how you guys are so connected and everybody was friends, and that's how Cox Sparrow started. Some bands are all about business, right? And uh, group members become more of associates rather than friends. And you guys are genuine mates. I read somewhere that your kids even play together in their own band. Yeah. Is yeah. that correct? Do they still play together? 
They did. Um, Are my, they done? No, oh. it, my son Tom and Steve Burgess, his son Jack, were, were, were in a band together for a while. That, that's now fallen apart. They still do their own thing separately. Um, the families are all very close still. You know, all, all the kids meet up and go together, go out together. Um, we make a point of spending... Everybody's every, like cousins, huh? We make, we, make a, we make a point every year spending New Year with, with everybody else. All the families all get together. We uh, sit, we what sit what down the hell of a eating. New Year party, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and it's what friends do. You know, it's what friends do. No one has any, any points to prove. You know, family, not a business. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's why there's no pressure on us and why we can enjoy what we're doing because Cox Sparrow exists even when there's no gigs. Because, you know, next month, next week, whatever, we can all be around each other's houses having a meal and we're together as a family. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter that there's no show, there's yeah. no gig to play. That's the motivation is, is being is friendship first. Hence, all these little things where you see it's from 72 to this date, and then there's like a lapse, and then yeah. it's from this yeah. to this. Yeah. It's all BS, right? Yeah. It's yeah. it was it was ever going, it was yeah. just you guys yeah. weren't playing, yeah. right? Exactly. The band has exactly never split that. up. The band, right. it's it's a going concern from day one. It's just when we choose to play, you know, absolutely. Tell me about the last time you guys played in New York City because this is the first time in 15 years. Uh, where did you play, and what was the occasion back then? CBGB's. Nice. It was our it was our first visit to the states. Really? Yeah, yeah. On a couple of occasions before that, people had tried to get the band over here, and for whatever reason, the deals never never came together. Um, we were asked then. Someone came together and said, "Let's let's do four shows." We said, "Okay, one in New York, one in Boston, one in LA, and one in San Francisco, on four consecutive days." Um, they offered us uh, a gig in New York, and we said. Can we play CBGB's, please? And they said, oh, we, we got you down for this other place, a bigger place. Said, no, 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 no. Can, oh, my can, God. Can we, can we please? A bigger place, you're like, no, 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 can we, no can I want to play CBGB's. That, that was a box for us to tick, you know? That was something, that was something we wanted to do. Exactly. That, was, that was important to us. Of and again, you know, as we said earlier, that's, it was on our terms, you know, the way that we wanted to do it, which was not bullying or anything. It was like a request. You know, we'd really love to play CBGB's, please, if we could. And on, we did. on a Thursday night. So yeah. we could have come to New York, taken the bigger venue, played a Saturday, cashed in, but it was like, no, you play in New York, you've got to play CBGBs. It was something that it's got to resonate. It's got to come from here, you know. So Thursday night, we play a small place. I mean, if you took that venue and put it anywhere else in the world, there's no redeeming features about it. It was a shithole. It was terrible sound, terrible stage, terrible uh, dressing rooms, terrible toilets. But it's fucking CBGBs. Exactly. And that's all we wanted to do. We still get excited about things like that. You know, that's still something that resonates with us and ticks a box, you know? Yeah, what we yeah. have now is the Bowery Electric. That place sucks. But I was actually tossed out of it. A, uh, funny, a funny story about that night, about the CBGB's night, was they, they put a sign on the door said, absolutely no skinheads, right? So you've never seen so many skinheads oh, in such a, such a collection of different, an uh, different hats, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they all had different hats on, right? They, they came and yeah, no skinheads here. Yeah. Let me ask you about that. A lot of people attribute, well, I, I've been guilty of it. I grew up in Florida where there's, you know, it's the South, a lot of, uh, you know, skinheads and, and things like that. And uh, I always mistakenly, I guess, attributed oi to skinhead things and racist things and stuff. What do you think about that? Like that whole... So if you look at the history of the OI thing, where, where right. it started, if you buy the first half a dozen OI albums and look at the bands that are on there, they're not skinhead bands. You've got yeah. bands like The Exploited, Peter and the Test Tube Babies, um, Cox Barra, <laughs> the Toy Dolls. Do you know what I mean? It was just not trendy punk. It was, a bit, it was just real, from the street, singing about, um, you know, as much as we love The Clash singing about some rebel thing in some faraway, you know, South American country. I can't resonate with that. I go to football on a Saturday or go down the, the, the pub with my friends. That's what these bands were singing about. So it wasn't a skinhead thing exclusively. A lot of skinheads were attracted to that because they liked the punk music but couldn't quite get on with the, you know, the, the image. The image. So it attracted a lot of hooligans, football hooligans, boot boy skinheads. In England... You had very much a split. Yes, you had the right wing um, uh, skinheads, and they'll always latch onto things. But then you had the skinheads that grew up with uh, Trojan and Jamaican reggae, and you had the explosion of all the two tone sure. bands like the Specials and and reggae. So it wasn't an exclusive. Skinhead wasn't a dirty word then. I think worldwide, mm-hmm. the, sk- the the skinhead thing got attributed to one political thing, and things started getting tarred with uh, with a wrong wrong brush, which is why. 
in, in the early 90s, when a lot of English bands started coming over, bands like The Business and whatever, it got rebranded as street punk because oi had become a dirty word. And we were claiming it back from that side of things, you know? I was always wondering about that, actually. I didn't realize that, how the street punk thing came in. Wow, it's like, kind of like a marketing thing. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, so, like, just like you were talking about just now, Daryl, you know, it's no secret you guys love pubs. Um, what's your drink of choice? Beer? For me, yeah, uh, uh, only beer. Beer. Beer, beer, and beer. Colin? Anything that's going. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that's going? Anything that's on the table. Well, if it was beer, what would be your preferred brand? <clears throat> and are you actually horrified that it actually, I, I'll admit right now, I genuinely love the taste of the beautiful nectar called Bud Light. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's uh, uh, it. That's it. Interview over. <laughs> um, I suppose you've had a choice. That's for you, Coletti. If I had a choice, it would probably be Guinness, I guess. Guinness? Yeah, but I like. I like. So you like your stouts? I like. I do, but I like coming here and trying New York beers. I like going to California and trying the California beers. I like going to the Czech Republic and probably drinking the, the best beer in the world, apart from Belgium, comes from the Czech Republic. Yeah. You like so, Polish beer? Like, like yeah, you said, we're in the Polish yeah, section. Yeah, yeah. We're wherever, wherever we go, wherever we go, we'll try. You had your Kia we'll pasta sandwich last there. night? I you did? did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got the yeah. Polish special. They're all yeah. down there. They and the make du- it. Oh, the, that's so... And, uh, and the dumplings, yeah. So was it like five or ten bucks? You get like a kielbasa sandwich and a beer. I love it. Yeah. Newcastle great. brown ale for me. <laughs> Newcastle brown ale? Yeah. That's a good taste. Or, or a Czech lager. If you had to do it over again, would you change your name to something easier for us dumb Americans <laughs> to pronounce? Good, good question. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll tell you what he does. Every time we come through immigration, it gives the guys there a laugh whenever we come in, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Worked our way up from East End pubs to gigs and backstage passes. Xbox in jets, West End clubs, Americans in dark glasses. Driving 10 great cars, drinking hotel bars, even making money in bed. They will be been our loss, they ain't worth a toss. It's about time they all drop dead. Take them all, take them all, pull them up against the wall and shoot them. Short and tall. Watch your ball Come on boys, take them all But tough shit boys, it weren't our fault Your record didn't make it We made your dogs, you made your shots But you didn't take it Well I gotta go, make another deal Sign another group for the company I don't suppose we'll ever meet again You better get back to the factory Take them all, take them all Put them up against the wall and shoot them Shoulder and toe, watch them fall Come on boys, take them all